Coming up, we make some quality coffee. We listen to a full-blown domestic out on the street. And the parts from BMW finally arrive. As one big box of parts. So the next task at hand is removing this entire headlight. So we should come out by just removing this screw. This top cover comes off and there's a bolt here, bolt here, bolt here, bolt here. Disconnect the power cables and this bracket I think might have to come out and then the whole thing lifts out. So I'm starting this video removing the headlights so we can gain access to two items, the AC dryer on the right hand side of the car and the ABS module on the left hand side of the car. Both of these items are located underneath the headlights. One cover. So these nuts basically hold the whole frame in and um, but there's also a center hex screw for actually adjusting the height uh, of the actual headlight. So I'm just going to mark this and hopefully it doesn't move. The inner screw doesn't move when I move the outer nut. Um, let's see what happens. Man, that's tight. Okay, that's good. The actual inner adjustment piece didn't actually move, so... Yeah, that looks good. Jesus, that's tight. Oh no. That's two. Oh, hey, there we go. One headlight. That's one of the advantages as well of having the pop up headlights, is they spend so much of their time below the bonnet and not in use that uh, they look brand new. As you can see, there's no UV damage or anything. And this is a hella part as well. And yeah, so it looks brand new. Fantastic. So same procedure on this side. And out it comes. Headlight number two. So the reason I actually removed both headlights is so it actually gives me good access here on the right side uh, to the actual uh, ABS pump here on the right side. And I'm not actually sure if that's good or bad yet. I know the brakes are absolutely appalling, so this may be contributing to it. Um, but removing this headlight here gives access to it. And it also gives access to the AC dryer here on the left side as well. So I have one of them on order as well. And basically when you're replacing the AC compressor, you're supposed to replace the dryer as well. So that's why I have one of them on order. So the line here, as you can see, basically came from the condenser and led into the dryer. And then that goes back into the actual uh, firewall itself. So you can actually see there's a fair bit of overspray here as well. So this must have been when this uh, front bumper was ever, whenever it was resprayed. So you can see obviously there it was repaired at some point. And it was obviously all done in situ. As you can see all the overspray here as well. And on the left side here, on one of the water hoses. So you can actually see the adjustments here on the, for, these are the actual adjusters for the headlights. So these are the, the center allens I was talking about. So you can see all four of them there, they actually hold the headlight in. And basically when you screw these, it lifts the headlight up or down. And that actually is what 
gives that kind of clean look on the top so you can actually adjust the height of the headlight in relation to the bumper itself so um, so it's good to have that removed and it actually just gives a bit more access as well so these are the actual brake ducts as well one on the left and the right side so um, that actually travels all the way through and you can see the actual back of the duct there so yeah, so yeah, give us a bit better access here, both on the left and the right side. And these boots are both perished here on the left and right side. This one's actually worse than the right side one. And as the actual filter box here, and this seem to be two separate parts, hopefully I can just order this as a separate part, so. Okay, so I'll start removing this filter box. to loosen these hose clamps. One filter box. Right, so now that I have the filter box removed, it gives us a better view here of the actual AC dryer, which looks like it's probably original, just judging by the sheer dirt that kind of surrounds this entire area. Um, it is absolutely filthy, as you can see. I'm quite reluctant to touch this actual, I presume that's a sensor of some kind, that connector. Those wires are likely very, very brittle. But yeah, it's very, very bad down there in terms of filth and dirt and grime but that whole dryer is getting replaced anyway and uh, there is some rust down here as you can see and uh, the good news i suppose about that is it's just the lower two inches there or so and um, a new section can be placed in there but you can see here it's basically that's metal and that's plastic and um, so it's just where those two meet basically so it's not a structural item in the slightest so obviously uh, Salt has been getting in there over the years and corroded it away. I need to see much the same story here on the right side as well. Uh, and now that I have this box removed, we can actually easily access this module here. Um, and the great news is all these brake lines look there look like they're essentially brand new. They're in excellent condition. Um, so yeah, much the same thing has happened on this side. Uh, that whole section uh, of the tower there is basically just crumbling away. Um, and again, you can see the same thing here. You can just see the same rust there on the left side. So yeah, removing those air boxes was definitely a good idea because it gives me a chance to get at some of these hydraulic lines as well. Um, gives better access to these oil cooler lines here as well. And again, just allows me just to give the whole area general cleanup and access areas that I wouldn't ordinarily be able to get to. So um, and you just see the sheer amount of dirt here as well. So yeah. Um, yeah, time to get going on some cleaning, I think.
Right, so now that I have both the left and the right side of the car completely cleaned up and it's all looking actually pretty clean, pretty fresh, I'm going to focus my attention on this whole centre area. And I, I don't know why I've been putting off removing this entire uh, fluid radiator for some time. It needs to be replaced. I have it on order. Uh, this is actually the hydraulic fluid cooler. And as you can see, it's an absolute tatters. And the reason for that is because there's a stamp here saying March 1991. So it is the original uh, fluid cooler. So these lines need to be replaced, these rubber lines anyway. And obviously the cooler itself, these have been leaking over God knows how many years. So this is all coming out. There's two bolts here, one bolt here. Once that's out, I can clean up this entire middle section. Um, and yeah, I can go from there. So let's get started. Look at the state of that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. If ever a part needed replacing, this is surely the daddy. Straight to the bin. Does this need to be replaced? I think it's actually okay. It just needs a bit of cleaning up. So that's a vast improvement now in terms of cleanliness here for this entire center area of the engine bay. As you can see it's all nice and clean, no more dirt or grit or grime. And I suppose you're probably all wondering what on earth is he doing cleaning all the inner gubbins of the engine bay when you're not even going to be able to see them. They'll be, I mean this whole area is just, they're the rubber grommets where the radiator sits and the condenser sits and uh, all the coolant pipes and uh, the fan shroud, all that kind of stuff just covers all this stuff up. I mean, but there's a few reasons for doing it. I suppose reason number one is I'm a bit of a clean freak. I like all this stuff to be pristine, even if you can't see it. But uh, the main reason is if you continue to allow all that dirt and grime and oil to sit on the components as they get wet over time, I mean, they're just going to continue to rust the car. So that stuff has to come off. Um, I suppose the second reason is as well is removing all the dirt actually exposes uh, where the rust is um, so I mean if you leave all these parts covered in black and grit you're just gonna, not going to know where any of the damage is uh, if there is any at all so here's a prime example yeah, you can see all this rust now it thankfully it does appear to be just surface rust I rubbed away some of this with uh, just a bit of 80 grit sandpaper literally just five seconds and you're down to bare metal within just a, a few seconds so uh, I think most of this will clean up this isn't a major structural part uh, of the car. Now it does add some rigidity, it does connect the left and the right side, um, but it is purely just a, a supporting bracket for the radiator and various components as well. So, um, But again, it does appear to be just surface rust. Um, so that will all clean up. Um, so yeah, now that I have this whole area clean, now it does need to be cleaned a bit more down the left and the right hand sides but I just want to move on to removing uh, the actual AC compressor because I've got a brand new one sitting in the house and I'm pretty sure just four bolts holds this on so there's a bolt here another one towards the back and same at the bottom on the left uh, same at the bottom uh, further inwards basically so I want to get this thing removed and um, yeah and we go from there That's the heat shield. It's not budging. Jesus Christ. So I've actually swapped to a breaker bar here. Hopefully this can break it free. This doesn't nothing well. 
No. That's just random, eh? Yeah. That's about the strip. Okay, so I spent the last 30 minutes basically removing this connection here off the AC compressor. The reason it took so long is this bolt is completely seized in place. There was absolutely no budging it. I started stripping the actual Allen head on it. Um, I tried pliers, I tried getting a wrench over the bolt head, um, basically filing away a section of the bolt head, getting a wrench on it, trying to move it that way, it did not budge. Uh, so I ended up just cutting off the head entirely and um, there's a very very slight bit of damage here on the outside of the connection but uh, I got the head off that allowed me to get this piece off this is completely seized in the compressor but that's of no odds as the entire compressor is coming out anyway so uh, <laughs> the amount of time I wasted trying to get that disconnected is just crazy but it's off now and this allows me to remove the AC compressor Number three. Right, now it's time to start thinking about how this is actually gonna come out. So you've got the chain tensioner here. So there's only the single chain in this engine, obviously. So this is the uh, tensioner on the right side of the block. Um, this bolt's gonna come out. So I don't think the compressor is gonna have to lift up at all. So hopefully it should just drop down slightly and come out forward. So everything is out of the way. That's the old power harness, so we should be good to go after this one's loose. There we go, and one AC compressor. I'm just doing a quick visual comparison between the old compressor and the new one. Um, they're pretty much 99% exactly the same, but there's one or two key differences. So this new unit is a Denso unit. Uh, as you can see there, it's an original Denso part. Um, and as you can see, the layout is pretty much the same. The connections are all in the same uh, spot. All the mounting points, uh, they're in the same location as well. Um, but uh, one of the main differences that I'm after noticing is uh, this additional power harness that's on the old one. And as you can see, it's not on the new one. And after doing a bit of uh, reading online, it appears that this basically has like a, a seize detection uh, system whereby it automatically disengages the clutch if it feels that the compressor is in any way um, seized basically to stop the belt from snapping. Uh, and that's what this is. This is basically like a rotation sensor to check if it's actually spinning. So that's basically why the connector on the new one only has a single pin and this one has three pins because this harness here actually makes up uh, two of the pins in the connector so that system supposedly can be disabled um, I've read online that the new comp or sorry that the uh, original compressor design basically is no longer available now I don't know how true that is but at the end of the day I have the new one here anyway so supposedly that feature can be disabled that's something I'm gonna have to look into in the future and um, this mount is ever so slightly different as well uh, but the actual connection is it basically still sits in the same position it's just a little bit taller and these connections here are the same as well you've got two rolled pins here as well they seem to be like little uh, locators and I actually initially thought they were missing on the, on the new one but you can actually see them kind of seated in there so you also get two new bolts which is great that means I don't have to buy a new one to replace this and the new one is much quieter as well and this is the old one So there's not much, uh, there's no play in and out basically, but there is a bit of a bit of noise in this one. No doubt this one is probably still perfectly functional and probably can be rebuilt, but I'm just playing it safe going for a new one. So now that I have it removed, I can move on to removing the dryer. Right, now how does the dryer come out?
finally removed. So I have these connections removed now and I think it's probably going to be easier to remove the dryer if this duct is out of the way. And that actually disconnects pretty easily. Put a slide up and out though is the question. It does. And that gives me access now to some very rusty bolts. Jesus. That does not look good. So this is definitely the original bracket because, or sorry, the original dryer, because look, I mean, the bracket's completely rusted through. So there's 30 years of disintegration right there. I'd say if I wobble this enough, I could actually probably break the bracket. The good news is the actual uh, brace below it doesn't look too bad. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look great either. But uh, yeah, the bracket on the actual dryer is definitely shot. So let's try and get this bolt out. Imagine that this uh, connector bracket that needs to be transferred over to the new one. Um, and just look at the state of that bracket. And actually, thankfully down here isn't actually bad at all. Um, that looks like, yeah, actually it looks like that was originally part of the bracket as well. That's completely rusted through and snapped off. So thankfully, I'm, I imagine all this is going to clean up pretty well. But that is one nasty dryer. I'm still baffled by why it's so dirty. And that's that dirt is nothing compared to the, how bad it was before I cleaned it off. This whole section here was destroyed in crud as well. So most likely it's probably a hole in the actual um, liner here um, from the front wheel. And it's probably just getting destroyed with mud in this area. So at least it's out. Well, that's a lot cleaner now. Um, just had a quick test there with some sandpaper and a grinder just to see uh, what I was looking at here. And the grinder basically did that in one second flat. So straight back to metal. Um, and then this is, uh, well, I couldn't actually just get the angle grinder in the correct angle to get at this. So I just added with a bit of sandpaper, but just goes to show an angle grinder just tears through the rust straight away. Um, I did a small little test up here as well. And again, the little bit that I could actually reach with the disc um, it just went through it in one two seconds straight back to metal so thankfully the rust is literally just surface rust so that whole area is nice and clean okay so these are my eight banjo bolts as you can see um, and as mentioned in the last episode i'm going to be wiring all these together to stop them from coming loose so i picked myself up some safety wire this is 0.8 of a mil and as you can see there's a hole drilled in each of the heads of the bolts um, so they were, came back quite sharp from the local machine shop where I got them done. Um, but as you can see, I added a chamfer onto them to make sure that the wire doesn't you know, get eaten through over all the coming years. So uh, the hole is considerably larger than 0.8 of a mil, but it's, you know, the last thing you want is to have a hole that's too small. So as you can see, each head is drilled and that allows me to pass the wire through and interlock all the bolts essentially in pairs to stop them from coming loose. I got a full set of new aluminium washers as well. These are the dealer uh, banjo bolt washers. These are the old ones which obviously can't be reused as they've been flattened and they won't uh, produce a, a great seal. So I've got the correct torque values to get these uh, basically torqued down uh, into the cylinder head and I can do that now. One thing I didn't actually show in the last video was the damage that I did to the end of this oil sprayer bar. So that's obviously the bar that sits on top. And when I was just checking the torque values of these bolts, I didn't actually tighten this one too much. I just basically tightened it. And by twisting it, it bent the bar. Um, now I tried to bend it back into shape and it ended up looking like this. Um, there's a slight indentation in it. So just to be sure I'm replacing this entirely. So that's for the bin and I have a brand new OEM from the dealer oil sprayer bar and that's going to get installed right now. So I have all four bolts 
in the sprayer bar here right now. I'm just going to go finger tight with these bolts. Just one at a time, really gently. Get them started and then torque them down to spec. And one thing that I didn't actually mention is I actually have all of these numbered so they're scratched into the heads one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the same bolts are going back into the same holes. That's basically because assuming that they were in the correct um, or the correct torque value was applied to them when I came across them, uh, I basically marked them in the position that they're in. So um, that way the holes that have been drilled in them uh, should all correspond to each other and that way the wiring uh, should work out pretty well, fingers crossed. I've got my torque wrench set to the correct value. Just going to start tightening these up. Okay, so fast forward a few minutes, I have this one done. So I wanted to kind of familiarize myself with the process before I actually uh, showed you guys how I do it. So first thing I do is get the safety wire. I've got a length cut off here. And I pass it around this right hand bolt and I make the top section of the wire ever so slightly longer just so that they're kind of equidistant after I wrap the long side around. As you can see now they're both roughly the same length. Now you want to pull this tight and then start twisting the wires together. Kind of lock this position in place like so and then to speed up the process you can get special pliers that make this winding process easier but all you essentially need is a pair of vice grips which i appear to have mislaid okay so i found them and I want to just basically clamp the two wires together so that they're roughly the same length. And all I do is basically start twisting the wires together. I want to make sure I'm twisting the right way. I think that's the wrong way. And just keep twisting. And as you can see, the twist gradually start to form in the wire. So there is a fine art to this, there's like all kind of technical details on the amount of twist that you need, all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to leave it at that kind of length. That's twisted together. Now I just want to cut off some of this excess, which isn't required. And I want to basically just and twist this last section that I'm after doing. Now I can pass one of these wires straight through the bolt. I'm going to pull it nice and tight. And then last to twist the last two wires together to lock it all down. Obviously you don't want to twist it too tight because then you risk actually breaking the wire. So there's a nice bit of tension on that. Okay so now that I've got the wire installed you can kind of see the way it's orientated it's wrapped around this bolt and then it goes up onto the top of this bolt. So as you might imagine, if this bolt were to start to back out, it's going to go anti-clockwise. So as it's turned anti-clockwise, it pulls this cable, so it essentially can't move. Even if it were to move, it could move maybe a single millimeter or so. And even if it were managed to pull on this, this actually tightens this bolt. So it gets to a certain point where both bolts are kind of working against each other. So that's basically the idea of the safety wire. So now that it's all completed, I can just snip off this excess. Be careful not to lose the small pieces and that's the job done.
So in preparation of sorting the huge amount of parts I have coming, I decided to dedicate a full room of the house to sorting and categorizing them. So this just involves laying out some tables. Um, it allows me to keep better track of what I'm spending, what I'm ordering, and what I'm actually receiving. So it's finally here guys, this is my order from JKC BMW and look at the size of this box, it is a monster box, it must, it must be 12-15 kilos of parts um, and there's 78 separate parts in here so it took a while for the guys, uh, Jared and the guys up in JKC to get this stuff categorised make sure everything is included. I'm going to double check it all now against uh, my invoice and make sure everything that I ordered is here and make sure all the parts are the correct ones and uh, because there could be mistakes on my part, potentially on their part, but obviously a lot more likely on my part. Um, I've been putting this off for so long because it's such a daunting task, um, but I better get started now. Okay, so welcome to the parts room. I mean, this place is a sheer mess at the moment, but what am I doing here? I've got the laptop open. I've got a list open here on the left side. This is basically a list that I sent to the dealer. These are all the parts that I've requested and parts that I need. And I've got my BMW invoice here for all these parts that have arrived. And what I'm basically doing is I'm comparing everything I've received against the invoice, so everything that I've paid for. And I'm also comparing the invoice against my initial list to make sure everything that I ordered on the list is actually on the invoice. So there's uh, two sections to that. And I've got real OEM open here on the right side of the screen as well, just for reference. So what I'm basically doing is I'm grabbing a random part. So here we have three random aluminium washers. No idea what they're from. So I pull the last four digits, 3130. I have a quick search here. 3130 on my own list and that is coming up as an intake manifold temp sensor gasket and um, so it's called a gasket but it's probably just a seal ring so i'm just going to paste that into a real oem make sure i have the right part and sure enough it's pulling up the intake manifold uh, diagram and there you can see there is part number nine, or sorry, indicated on the diagram is number nine. And it's a seal ring for one of these temp sensors going into the back of the intake manifold. There's two intake manifolds, so there's two parts required. So that's what that is. And sure enough, on my own list, I also have another hit for the same one. So it's for the rear, rear coolant channel temp sensor O-ring. So if I back out of that, and if I go into the other diagram, um, there you can see the actual seal ring is actually on the rear cool, cool, coolant channel temp sensor as well. So three parts were required, one for each of the intake manifolds and one for that rear channel. 
Uh, so I have re received three, that's why there's three there. And what I do is, and I just did it a few moments ago, I just write on the actual label what the part is. Rear coolant channel, temp sensor, slash intake manifold, seal ring. And um, that's so basically I can come in from the garage, I want a specific part, and it's already labeled and I know what it is. Like I say, you can look at all these parts and you've got no idea what they are. For example, there's another pack of rings and they're a completely different part. So you want to be able to know what they are really quickly. So I've highlighted that I've received those parts. So what I do is I just stick in three arrows, 3130, 3130. And I basically mark that part is received. And I also go onto my invoice, find the same part number, 3130. And again, I've already done it there, mark it off as received. So I've received that part as well. Uh, so that's basically what I'm doing. Uh, it's a lot of effort. I've already done maybe about 20 parts, maybe 25, and I've already been at it an hour and a half. So, But it's important to keep track of all these parts, make sure I have the correct parts uh, for whenever I need them. Make sure, especially everything that I've paid for, I've actually received, and everything that I actually require is actually on the invoice as well. So that's all very important. So I'm just going to keep at this uh, until it's done. This would be a good time to mention where I actually source my parts from, and that's directly from JKC BMW in Northern Ireland. Now, the guys aren't directly sponsoring my videos as such, but they are giving me a very healthy discount on my parts orders. As you can see, this invoice alone still cost me over £3,000. Uh, but Jared and the guys in the parts department, they're phenomenal to deal with. If ever you have any parts requests or a bulk order or anything of that kind of nature, I'd highly recommend giving them a shout and they look after you no problem at all. I just want to get this oil filter housing removed just so I can clean up down below here a lot better. Yeah, see one or two leaks. I just want to see where they're coming from. And uh, it's just going to give me better access to this general area. At this point, I want to gain some better access to the left side of the engine base. So this involves the removal of the oil filter housing, the hydraulic fluid housing, and the hydraulic fluid pressure regulator unit. So I'll remove this sensor first. This one's a lot tighter. There we go, one filter housing. Okay, so we have one line, two lines, three lines, four lines, five lines going into this hydraulic filter. Oh, God. Looks like it was leaking before at some point because this one has two hose clamps on here. And there's some signs of seepage here as well. Um, some of this might actually be from the oil filter housing, it's hard to know. Uh, it looks like it's a combination of the two, to be honest. Oh, yes. One reservoir. That is one hell of a mess. God. This is the hydraulic pressure regulator unit and removing it will give better access to the very tightly bunched cooling parts that are located behind it.
That is a seriously heavy piece of kit. Okay, so that pretty much marks the end of another episode. So this is the end of episode five, and I know progress has been pretty slow, um, but I'm pretty much at the point now whereby I have everything that I planned to take out of the engine has been taken out. So the left and the right side, the whole front of the engine, the engine, the actual main block itself, everything's pretty much stripped out. So um, the very last things I'm gonna take out are some of the heater hoses down the back left of the engine, um, and that's where I'm gonna start replacing parts and then slowly moving forward. So. Um, like I say, I know progress has been slow, just getting everything edited, uh, getting parts ordered, everything categorized, everything uh, documented. Um, it just takes so long. Uh, sometimes I wish I wasn't actually recording this because it would just move so much quicker, just being able to work in my own time. But um, yeah, like I say, from this point forward, it should get a little bit more exciting. The stuff gets to be replaced, you know, the momentum hopefully will uh, improve and the pace of the whole project will improve as well. So, um, so thanks for sticking with me. Uh, please subscribe. And I'll see you all in the next video.